It's indeed our uh, pride, privilege, honor to host uh, this great personality over here. I mean, he's uh, unique in the sense that he has been uh, the director of the CIA and uh, Secretary of State. I don't think anybody else has done that in the long history of the United States. But before that, he's an Army graduate, uh, a rank holder from West Point. He's a rank holder from uh, Harvard Law School. He's uh, practiced with a law firm. He started his engineering firm and he's been a successful entrepreneur. He did business in India. Uh, he ran for Congress. Uh, and uh, finally, he was uh, on merit picked up into the Trump administration. And then he's done some fantastic work globally, uh, which we are seeing even now some of those policies uh, you know, continuing, uh, and, and, and many of them sort of of great value to India. And therefore, we thought on this uh, emergence of India as a superpower in a multipolar world, who better than to you know, speak to uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo. Thank you, sir, for coming. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's, it's lovely to be back in India. I think this is the 20th or so time that I've been here. As you said, I, uh, a long time ago when I was a much younger man, I operated a business with a partner here uh, in Hyderabad, in Madras, uh, where we made machine parts for HAL. And so I was here a lot. My wife and I both love Bangalore and came to really appreciate this country a great deal, long before anybody knew who the heck I was. Thanks, sir. So, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to start with a broad question. During your time as Secretary of State, it seems that U.S.-India relations underwent a paradigm shift from where we see it towards much greater cooperation at every level and much greater level of trust between our two countries. I think, you know, all of us here, we looked at U.S. as, uh, you know, a formidable player on the global stage, the, the, the preeminent superpower, but we always looked at it and said, you know, it's nothing much in it for us because, you know, we're not very sure whether how we aligned. But that has changed in the last one decade. I mean, of course, there are other things that have also happened before that, but uh, very, very specifically post the Trump administration, uh, we see those changes coming up. How did this shift come about, uh, Mike, uh, in your eyes? Yeah. Um, so look, I, I, know, I know the history, uh, the post-World War II history. We were both joking before that we were both British colonies at one point in our national history. Uh, but we came to understand the Trump administration, uh, and I think, I think this was underappreciated. So everybody knows the headline, right? America first. And that, that was off-putting to some. I, I completely get why folks would think that. But President Trump and I both, we, we wanted the Indian people to put their country first. We wanted every nation to do the things that mattered to them. And for us, the, one of the things that mattered to us enormously was to recognize the world as it really was. And the world had shifted post-World War II dramatically, right? We'd had 70 plus years of, of relative good order uh, but this had shifted. The power structures in the world had shifted, and India was now an important power in the world stage. Not, not a power that was soon to be important, but one that was important while we were there, to today as it exists. I, I still believe this with all my heart. And so we worked our tails off to, uh, uh, to build that relationship. It was complicated. Trade relationship between our two countries, complicated. Uh, but we, we recognize that for America to be successful, for our people to be more prosperous and secure, we need to have deep economic relationships between the United States and India, deep security relationships between the United States and India too. And when we did that, um, we'd have good diplomatic relationships and we would collectively be able to build out the next 75 years of a prosperous globe as well. So it was deeply in our interest to do it. We, we were determined, we were, we were very fortunate. We had Prime Minister Modi, we had a great counterpart while we were in office. There were other places we tried to do this kind of thing, but we didn't have as good a counterpart. So we were very fortunate, the timing was right. And I'm proud of the work we did to build out both our, our bilateral relationship between the two countries and our relationship with other partners in the region, including the Quad, which had begun to become very effective at protecting each of our two countries. Yeah, so that brings us to this. Uh, the, 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 the good thing is that uh, post the Trump uh, administration, uh, the change seems to have persisted uh, mm -hmm. with a, a new administration which came in. And, uh, you know, this whole thing about uh, you know, alignment in the Indo-Pacific. So what is the future vision for Indo-Pacific? How do you think it aligns with India's interests? 
Well, we all, we all have to form our own judgments, but from the American perspective, the, the great challenge of this next generation is the threat that's posed by the Chinese Communist Party. If you said, what's the singular greatest geostrategic risk to the next generation of Indian kids not having more security and more prosperity, that risk comes from Xi Jinping and from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you all see it, you're, you're, you're closer to it than we are geographically, but we all experience it economically as well. And this has been something that uh, we, we, we want China to succeed economically. We're happy competing with them, all of us should be. But Xi Jinping intends something that is fundamentally different from that. And so when you begin to think about the Indo-Pacific, uh, we tackled it in, in, in three pieces. First, uh, we needed a deeper, important set of relationships with broadly Asia, including the Middle East. And so we worked what became the Abraham Accords to try and take down the tension in the Middle East itself and to confront the strategic threat that came from the Islamic Republic of Iran's uh, regime. Uh, and then second, we needed to build out with our friends in Australia, South Korea, Japan, here in India, a set of relationships that were economic and military. The set of capabilities that made clear that we were determined to protect the things that really mattered. Basic property rights, human dignity, all the things that, that democracies do the best, but that uh, every nation has a responsibility to protect. And so we were, we were trying to build a construct. Well, by the way, Pacific Island nations, I don't think I mentioned, we were trying to increase the set of inter economic connectivity between those countries in a way that would convince the Chinese Communist Party that on the world stage um, it could have its place, it has over a billion people, but it had, to, it had to conform to the basic requirements of international norms. If you want to lead in the world, it is not okay to hold a million of your own people in internment camps. If you want to lead in the world, when a virus breaks out in one of your laboratories, you need to invite the world in to help you solve the problem, not lock down and shut down and lie and obfuscate. That is a, that is a global requirement to keep the world safe. We had seven million plus people die across the world um, because the Chinese Communist Party chose at that moment not to let the world help them figure out how to address this issue. Instead, they disappeared journalists sent people on airplanes to Milan. I mean, this is, this is not how world leaders behave. It's not how the Indian government would have behaved. It's certainly not how the American government would have behaved as well. And so when you think about the Indo-Pacific, to, to, get, to get the world right for the next 75 years is an imperative that those of us who believe in the most fundamentally important things in the world work together to address those problems and demand that other nations comport with that type of behavior. How they run their internal workings, there'll be differences, but the way that we engage in the world, uh, if you want to lead, it requires a certain set of understandings, not the least of which is basic decency and the rule of law. So despite uh, good relations between our two nations during your time as Secretary, a comprehensive trade deal eluded us. In your eyes, what roadblocks remain in that uh, in that deal, even now, what needs to change in order to make it possible? Tell me what you mean. Explain what you mean by the question. The U.S.-India trade uh, deal. I mean. Oh my gosh! Look, every country wants to protect the things that matter to it most. We're guilty of that as well, um, and I, I don't fault nations for wanting to protect jobs and create wealth in their own country. We we simply know that the cumulative well-being of the globe depends on massive interconnectivity, and. Uh, it, we have that between our two countries. There's lots of foreign direct investment by the United States here in India. I, I hope there will continue to be more. Uh, there is significant investment by Indian companies. I, I think the next trillion dollar company is likely to come from here, likely to come from India. Uh, we see it, by the way, we see uh, Indian students coming to learn. Uh, we see Indian Americans running some of our biggest companies in America. The connectivity between our two economies is deep and we, we ought to figure out a way to get our trade people to figure out uh, a set of pathways to increase both, uh, both the trade between the two countries and how our currencies interact with each other in a way that makes good sense for each of our two countries. I think it's possible to do. Well, right now, if you were, uh, you know, if this had, your administration was there in power, uh, how would your reaction be with uh, reference to the Ukraine situation? Yeah. What would be the differences? In the, in the end, security depends on 
deterrence, and deterrence it follows directly and almost solely from perceived risk. You have to convince Vladimir Putin that the risk exceeds the benefit of continuing what he's doing. How do you do that? The answer is uh, we shouldn't have dribbled out HIMARS. We shouldn't have slowly provided increased intelligence. Uh, we shouldn't have said we'll deliver uh, armored vehicles. We collectively, the West, will deliver armored vehicles over months. We should today not be withholding the continued resupply of the tools and equipment that they need. We should be providing them everything that they can absolutely, that they can deploy militarily to convince Vladimir Putin that you have to end this assault on the, the basic fundamental ideas that have built this world for the last 70 years. I, I don't think anybody should doubt Vladimir Putin's intention wasn't Kyiv. Kyiv was a waypoint along the way to control of even greater chunks of Europe. And we collectively must push back against that. We talked a bit earlier. I, I hope India will come to see even more robustly that it's in its best interest to make clear that what's happening in Europe today is unacceptable. The invasion by a large country they perceive as vulnerable, crossing its borders militarily, is just simply unacceptable. And we, we know this is a tough region, and we know that Xi Jinping is watching what's happening in Ukraine. And make no mistake about it, uh, e every nation has a responsibility to, at the very least, make clear precisely where they stand, precisely what they find acceptable, and make sure that those nations that are supporting the aggressor, those nations that are supporting the country that has conducted what uh, will, I think as we unpack it, certainly appear to the world to be war crimes. Those are the kinds of things that we just, the good nations just can't accept and we ought to call them out and we ought to do all the things that we can. Uh, you know, it, Ukraine hasn't asked for a single American soldier. They haven't asked for a single sailor. They simply said help us with the equipment and tools we need and we're prepared to fight for our own country and they have. And that has been successful to date. I pray that it will continue to be. And had we done more collectively, had we done more faster, I don't even mean since February. Everybody thinks the launch point for this was February 2022. This began in 2015, right? Putin invades Ukraine by taking Crimea in, but, but in the 2014-2015 time period when it's culminated. For four years he doesn't, and then he goes after it again. We lost deterrence. We, we, we didn't threaten Vladimir Putin's security in a way that said it will be unacceptable to do this. And the result is that you see a, a land invasion of Europe in modern times, something I think most of us had prayed was ancient history. So that brings us to the other side of the, uh, the Eurasian continent, Taiwan. Uh, U.S. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan in uh, 2022. And, uh, you know, whatever has been, you know, conjecture or spoken about or debated about the, you know, parallels between China and Taiwan and U.S., uh, I mean, Russia and uh, Ukraine. Uh, so what is, what do you think, uh, you know, is the evolving U.S. Uh, stand on the Taiwan matter? Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know exactly what the Biden administration's posture is. It's been a bit confusing. Uh, here's, here's, uh, but I'll give you my assessment. Uh, it is, uh, Xi Jinping has made clear, but there's no, there should be no doubt in anybody's mind what Xi Jinping's intentions are with respect to Taiwan. He uses the term reunification, although Taiwan has never been part of the Chinese Communist Party's uh, power. Uh, second, he has a timeline, and we don't know what that timeline is. Uh, so he'll get to play his hand. We should collectively play ours, which is enormous economic might, enormous power. We should provide the Taiwanese today, not, uh, not six months from now, not when the Chinese uh, PLA is uh, invading the island or when the Chinese Communist Party's air force is flying around or the Navy blockading the island. We should provide them today the tools that they need to convince and deter Xi Jinping from taking aggressive military action against Taiwan. I'm convinced it's possible to do. This is not a fait accompli. Xi Jinping simply, just much as we fail to deter Putin, we have to deter Xi Jinping from an attack on Taiwan. I'm convinced that we collectively can do that, but it can't just be an American effort. It's going to take all of us who believe that that would be a bad outcome. And I would, I would share for everyone in this room, uh, 
A military conflict in Taiwan is a global economic catastrophe. Certainly because of TSMC, the massive semiconductor facility that sits on the southern end of the island, but also because it is nearly impossible to imagine that this is contained with a conflict between China and Taiwan. It is, it is difficult to imagine how Japan does not become involved. When Japan becomes involved, we have a treaty guarantee with Japan. This gets big fast. And so the central idea of deterring Taiwan is essential, not just for the Taiwanese people, but for all of us who want a continued set of economic relationships that permit the next generation of people and the next billion people in the world to be fed as well. So as you know, Mr. Secretary, India has essentially been in a frozen conflict with China since the border conflict in 2020. <laughs> so we have a border problem with them also. You have been extremely vocal about the challenges presented by China's rise. How do you see India's role in meeting the China challenge globally? What are the strategies that you see as successful? And before that, what do you think this frozen conflict uh, will sort of, uh, how will it evolve? Goodness. Um, so I was in the middle of it uh, in, in 2020, working with your government as the Chinese were uh, attacking Indians on your northern border. Um, your, your folks did an amazing work. Um, we, we, we were, we were uh, I'm, you, you should be very proud. <laughs> Myself and Myself and Secretary Esper were pretty good too. Um, we provided, you, you asked, we answered as quickly and as fast as we could with the things that you all said you need uh, to not only repel in the moment, not only for the tactical moment, but for the things you needed strategically to prevent China from continuing this indecent onslaught on, on India. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's still, uh, as best I can read, I no longer have access to classified information. As best I can tell, it's pr still pretty tense in the region. Uh, I don't think Xi Jinping has changed his view that he'd like to continue to move, literally move the goalposts uh, in the region. And you all should be vigorous in defending the things that are yours, the sovereignty that is yours. Uh, more broadly, uh, that India's role isn't something, I, I, sometimes I hear people say, well, what should India do in the future? It's today. We, we, we're living this today. This is a real time, ex this is a real time activity. The Chinese Communist Party's effort, we see it with the debt that sits in Pakistan and their efforts to control Pakistan. We see it in Africa, with their efforts to use their money to exert political control all throughout uh, good swaths of southern Africa. The, the time is now, the time is for each of us. This is an economic conflict. I described the Chinese Communist Party have been at war economically with the United States for 40 years. I think that continues to be the case. And so uh, what, what India should do is continue to grow and prosper. It should continue to provide for its own security. That's both building its own national security systems uh, along with its uh, partners in the region, but also the work that's being done to build up your defense industrial base here is absolutely vital. You're becoming a significant exporter of, of systems to the world. I think, that's, uh, I think that's really important. It'll create jobs and wealth and prosperity here in India. That is fantastic, important. Uh, and you, you, you can't have a secure nation without a prosperous economy. Right? My most important tool as Secretary of State, wait, it, it mattered that we had a really good Navy and a kick-butt Army, Army guy, I could say that. Um, but what really mattered was that we had the American economy and the fact our capacity for innovation and creativity, just as you do here in India. And so if you said, what's the most, the absolute most vital thing that India can do to confront the Chinese Communist Party is continue to grow and to build your economy and to educate your people and to train the next generation of technology workers and manufacturing workers, all the things that create uh, wealth and prosperity will be the same tools that will convince Xi Jinping that continue to threaten the world's not in his best interest. Th those, those are the ways that we do it. It is this twin, the twin pillars of economic might and a military capability that go hand in hand to create the very deterrence that the world needs. So we've been hearing about the China plus one policy that the world started pursuing, <laughs> I think for the last 10 years. Uh, and post COVID and during, uh, India is seen as a very, very big beneficiary of the same. So what is your take on this approach? The plus one strategy. Ah, uh, 
You know, I, I talk to lots of companies around the world uh, now that I'm uh, now an unemployed former diplomat. Uh, they all can see the risk of investment in China today in ways that I don't think they fully appreciated. And frankly, the conflict in Russia, I think, uh, brought that forward. Uh, I can't tell you how many American companies, I'm sure Indian companies as well, had to write off significant assets inside of Russia. The balance sheet risk to uh, major American companies inside of China is even greater today. And so they're all trying to figure their way through it. They are hopeful, as am I, that China will change its behavior and change its course but they can see that the political risk is real inside of China. And so they're trying to figure out places to go. India's enormous beneficiary. Vietnam has been an enormous beneficiary. Frankly, there's been onshoring to Mexico and Canada and the United States as well. As nations are trying to rebalance, uh, we, we talk about in terms of supply chains, but it's not just supply chain. Uh, they're, they're trying to rebalance their political risk around the world. And India is a wonderful place for them to do that. Uh, they can see it. They, they know that you are a reliable economic partner of the United States. And so I think, I think, the, I think the Indian economy and the Indian people will continue to benefit from that. Just one more question uh, regarding China. And this is in the area of the technology war, which is, uh, you know, seems to have uh, you know, slowly started to take off between uh, the U.S. and China in certain critical areas. I mean, of course, uh, critical components of semiconductors, uh, they are, you know, but there is artificial intelligence, and uh, a whole host of areas that there is going to be a sort of a tug of war which is happening. So what's your take on that subject? So there's two, there's two pieces to this, this technology set of issues. One is we should acknowledge that China is a very capable technological country on its own. In its own universities, they are very capable. They're not very deep. They're not deep in the same way that the United States and India and Europe are in technology. Uh, and so they are continue to be uh, very dependent on the West for a great deal of technology as well. Uh, we should prevent them from having access to technologies that they intend to use for military purposes that threaten the world. And that was our mission set in the Trump administration. We, what became known as the CHIPS Act was something that I started along with our Secretary of Commerce, uh, Wilbur Ross, where we began to recognize that we had a failed capability. We no longer could manufacture semiconductor wafers at a, uh, at a cutting edge level inside of the United States, nor could any of our partners. This wasn't just about U.S. manufacturing. This was, do we have a reliable set of partners that can maintain access to this technology in the threat of a conflict, in the threat that China should somehow be able to control the flow of that particular technology? And so we began to look at this more broadly, uh, including the, uh, the efforts uh, to build out the next generation of reduced carbon vehicles. And we could begin to see there were places inside of China where we didn't have access to the things that we would need. And so we began to work with India, with other countries around the world, to develop, out, to develop a set of alternative capabilities to make sure that we would never lose the capability to have the technology that we needed at the most important time nor would we continue to suffer blindly as we did for decades the Chinese Communist Party stealing our technology, manufacturing it in China, and then dumping it on the world in ways that harmed American workers. Uh, and so those were the pillars of how we tried to think about technology, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that the Biden administration has largely continued this. I wish that they'd be even a little more aggressive in protecting this technology that matters so much to the Western world and to democracies across the globe. So here's a question which probably sort of uh, we will look at from your, uh, your, your understanding from your days with the CIA. We're talking about our neighbor, Pakistan. Growth is stalled and inflation has soared in, the, in that country of 20, 220 million people over the past one year. With the rupee sharply depreciating now, uh, the Pakistani rupee and reserves of currency dwindling, that country is struggling to import essential products like food leading to stampedes at distribution centers, fears that Pakistan would actually default on its debt have lurked for months. Then there is a very uh, unlikely situation in Pakistan where there is a political leader who suddenly sort of uh, risen, uh, you know, way beyond uh, anybody else has in recent <laughs> times as a person who's able to, uh, you know, uh, ignite uh, the imagination of the people at large. And there has been uh, visuals which come out from there, which are, uh, you know, looks like uh, a major, uh, you know, revolt against. Uh, 
the power structure which has been there for the last 75 years actually, the Pakistan army. And it's the first time that we're seeing the Pakistani people out in the streets calling their army names, uh, you know, in, in language that we can understand probably. <laughs> you will not be able to relate. The, the slogans on the street are pretty uh, derogatory of the army. So what do you think? How, what do you make of the turmoil in Pakistan? And uh, what do you think of, uh, you know, what will happen, uh, what is good? And what do you think the future is for Imran Khan versus the army? The army is an incredibly powerful force inside of Pakistan. I, I saw this when I was the CIA director, working with the army, uh, doing our best to deal with their intelligence service, the ISI. Uh, this was at our time, all while we were trying to manage the conflict in Afghanistan as well. Our most, our most frequent conversations with the Pakistanis were uh, along, their, along the Fatah, along the border there trying to prevent terrorism here in India and across the world. Uh, so that was, the, that was the focal point of our work with Pakistan. If, if you'll remember, it would have been early in our administration, maybe it was 2017, when we cut off all foreign assistance to Pakistan in an effort to get them to conform to global norms, to get them to behave. Uh, the Chinese stepped in, loaned a ton of money uh, to the Pakistanis. Uh, good luck getting that back. Uh, when I think of Pakistan today and I observe what's going on, what the world needs is a more stable Pakistan. Um, what they've done to Khan uh, is inappropriate. I, I, hope they'll, I hope they will follow their own internal rules, much as we have, if you have the rule of law here in India, we have it in the United States. Pakistan has a history of this as well, um, but it has ultimately been dominated by their military. I, I expect that will continue to, as a practical matter to be the case. Uh, what, what we should all do is um, uh, we should make clear that China's role there has been a net negative for the Pakistani people. The things that they have offered them, the money that they have loaned them, will ultimately give the Chinese Communist Party power over how Pakistan governs itself. That's not good for the Pakistani people. It's not good for this region. And then second, uh, and, and this is too long an answer, but, but there are tools that we all can use to decrease the likelihood of what you described, a collapse or chaos inside of Pakistan. Uh, very high end set of capabilities, 200 million plus people, a collapse of Pakistan will increase the very risk that we began this conversation around, the risk of terror, the risk of is, uh, Islamic extremism flowing from there into other parts of the region. It would be a very bad thing. And so we ought to collectively, India will have a role in this, uh, play the role to try and deliver the very stability. Even if we don't like the exact outcome that we get, it wouldn't be our A choice for how Pakistan is governed internally. That stability matters an awful lot. And if you put India first or America first, it is Pakistani stability, which should be at the top of our list of things we hope come from that place. Okay. And you think Ami would be a very important player in that? It seems, it seems very unlikely to me that we're ever going to see the Army be n unimportant in Pakistani government in any near-term period. Uh, look, I hope that civil, that's the, what the, what, we, we all want civilian rule there, right? We, this, is what we, this, is what, this is what we aim for in each of these governments. I hope, and Imran Khan began that process, I, I, I hope that we can find a way that civilian institutions, voters, democracy, rule of law will find an ever-increasing pathway there. But today, it's, it's clearly the case that the military still has a dominant role in how uh, affairs are governed inside of Pakistan. Uh, then we go to the next, uh, I mean, Pakistan's neighbor, which is Iran. Uh, and, uh, you know, developments post uh, the Trump administration the last few years and uh, the, the looming and increasing threat now of uh, that they may be close or much closer to uh, nuclear, uh, you know, weapons uh, and Israel's uh, reactions to that. So what is uh, U.S., uh, uh, your take on that yeah. subject, sir? Look, uh, India has a very important role here. Uh, it's, it, it's your neighborhood. Um, the Ayatollah is the destabilizing force in the Middle East. If you look at, uh, just, just, if you look at the risk, the security risk around the world, it is Hezbollah in Lebanon, it is the Iranian militias in Syria, it is the Houthis in Yemen, it is the uh, Iranian knuckleheads in Iraq, right? These are all underwritten by the Ayatollah and the IRGC. This is, this is the malign influence in the region that creates real risk. We were, we were very clear about that, and that's what enabled 
for the first time in decades, multiple countries to make peace with Israel. This is right, this, this was like, people said, oh, you can't do this, this is impossible. Well, we did, it happened. Uh, it happened because we were, we were grounded in reality, and I, I'm, I'm confident you all will be too. I'm confident India will be grounded in reality too. We should accept the reality that uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Emiratis, the Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis, the Omanis, these are good people who want to live in peace and grow their economies and take care of their own people. And the Ayatollah wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and just as soon take America out as well. You should know that I have a big security team. The Iranians continue to try to kill me every day. Um, this is, not, this is not how normal nations behave. And so the Biden administration got this one totally wrong. The Biden administration thought if we negotiate with them, we appease them, we allow their economy some slack, then, then they'll behave normally. Uh, I would tell you that history suggests that the Ayatollah has no intention of behaving in a way that is in the best interest of the Indian people or the American people. And so we ought to go back to a policy that punishes the regime helps the Iranian people get what it is they deserve. This is a, a nation of uh, 80 million people, brilliant history. Uh, the Persian history is remarkable. We should promote them, give them the space they need, and one day uh, Iran will join the community of nations trying just to make things better for their own people as well. But uh, the Ayatollah or any uh, head of a theocracy uh, would behave the way that he would because, uh, I mean, they look at all the Shia people all across the globe and countries which have those people as natural, uh, you know, as within their border. Yeah. So I think uh, that brings me to the question that we, you know, talk about in democracy, U.S., India. There is a feeling that there is, uh, you know, some sort of a religion getting mixed into uh, society a lot more than <laughs> earlier. The whole, uh, you know, talk of the left and right and the serious amount of uh, schism in, in ideologies. So what is your take on this subject across the world? I'm not just talking about Iran. I mean, there is Turkey, there is the U.S., there is India. Sure. I mean, there is talk about, you know, that, you know, sure, most people from abroad. I think I was talking to the World Economic Forum president a few days back, and one question that he asked is, you know, we hear about uh, religious um, persecution. I said, you know, I can't see it, but obviously that's the kind of thing that people are talking about. Why do you think this is coming up? I mean, social media and all that. Just uh, oh goodness, that's not new, right? Uh, this has been around a long time. Uh, let, let me start with Iran for a second. The, the Ayatollah is not a religious leader. He's a terrorist, right? He, he considers himself a religious right? He's, I mean, he's a we, we should be very clear. He, the, the Shia people are good people. This, this, this is not. This is not a. This is not religious zealotry. This is a kleptocracy, right? This, this is a desire to remain in power and steal stuff from the people. This is, this is not remotely connected to, to Shiism or, Islam, or Islamic faith in any way whatsoever. He uses this as a rubric to continue to terrorize not only the world but his own people. Uh, second, um, you know, this idea of, of, of religion uh, permeating government is not new. We, we, we discussed it a lot at our founding a couple hundred and fifty years back. Uh, for me, I, I'm a Christian evangelical. My faith is an important part of who I am. Um, but we govern as a, a, a nation that understands religious tolerance. And I, I hope every country will do that and get that right. Um, it is absolutely imperative that we permit religious freedom to expand everywhere. Uh, We'll, we'll, all have, we'll all think about this differently inside our own governments. But places that are more religiously free are more prosperous. Uh, and I hope every nation will find its way through to doing that. Well, gov government should never, turn, sh should never turn to use church to suppress others. I, I watch what's happening in China where a million Muslims are being held in the western part of the country. And for what all the world... For all the world, if you, it, when, when the world sees what's taking place there, it will remind you very much of internment camps that we all know from the 1930s in Germany. This is, this, by the way, it's not, about, it's not truly about faith. It's, it, it's about dominating an ethnic group. It's indecent. And so I hope every country will come to understand that governments have a responsibility to permit people of faith, whatever faith they may be, to observe their faith in the way that they want. Um, I actually think the world is headed in the right direction with respect to this. I think the headlines, I think certainly the headlines here in India don't reflect the reality of the religious freedom that exists in so many places in the world. And we worked hard in the Trump administration to try and help nations expand that as well.
Thanks. Most times when we talk about India's uh, you know, neighborhood, we talk about Pakistan and China, and we talked about uh, those two parts. Uh, what do you think India should do vis-a-vis -vis Iran? So, you said India has a responsibility. Sure, you, you, have, you have a responsibility. You should make clear to the Iranian people that you're with them and not with the Ayatollah. That's, it's, it's really that straightforward. Uh, uh, the Biden administration's theory has been to uh, not enforce sanctions in the same way we did. I think in the end, the only way that the Iranian people have a chance to, to get the regime, the leadership that they want, is if the, if the regime itself is starved of its capacity to build out its nuclear program and to build out its terror campaign across the region. So I would urge not only the Indian government, but most importantly my government, to go back to the set of policies that gave the Iranian people the space to organize and ultimately get the government they wanted. Two questions, last uh, two questions on India. Uh, India is, uh, India's stand on uh, Ukraine and uh, the the import of Russian oil, uh, you know, what we can look at and say as hunting with the hounds and running with the hares. <laughs> and that has been a little uh, hot topic uh, and it's sort of erupted here and there. Uh, what is your take on that subject? Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you feed the Russian beast, it's going to come get you. <laughs> uh, I, right, this, 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 is, this is it. If you continue to underwrite a regime like Putin's, He'll have more resources to continue his onslaught. And if there's one thing that the world, I think, forgets, because we've lived in this post-World War II order, I think the world forgets that you can't satiate folks like Putin. If he were today with a puppet government in Kiev, I don't think for a moment he'd stop there. And it may not be an invasion of France, but his effort to continue to expand his power in a way that is so indecent and so antithetical to the way that you live your lives here in India and we live our lives in the United States, you, you have to stop these guys. And so if you're purchasing crude oil from Russia and enriching Vladimir Putin, you are increasing risk that five or ten years from now the world will be in a more stable, more secure place than it is today. Um, it's, I get it. This is hard. Um, I regret that the United States has shut, shut in its energy, but I think if there's one thing the Europeans have learned is that you are not going to run the world on sunshine and windmills, at least for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years, that we're going to be using fossil fuels for an awfully long time, and that if you are dependent on a bad guy for your energy supplies, the bad guy will come one day to use that in a way that is to the harm of your own people. And I think. It is easy to say, gosh, we need this today. We, let's just let's look the other way. Fair enough. There are there's time sequencing to lots of things. But in the end, if you become dependent on bad guys for things that are really critical to your own nation, uh, you, s someday this will come back and bite you. And the Europeans have seen this. I, I remember so well. We were, in, we were in Europe in 2017. I was sitting with President Trump, and we were telling the Europeans if you keep buying all of your gas from Gazprom, something's going to break. And we did not know when, nor would we have predicted that this is how it would unfold. I don't pretend that we predicted this at all. But we did predict that if you continue to prostate yourself to the Russians, they will come back and use that leverage someday. And I would urge every nation that's thinking about that to have a pathway that disconnects them from being totally reliant on folks who don't share their understanding of the way the world ought to work. And that, but that's true for our country as well. That brings me to the last question, uh, which is on the theme of uh, the conclave here. India is a vibrant democracy and now the most populous nation on the planet. From, I think on April 13th, we surpassed China. And, uh, and that's apparently historic. Never in the, in the world's history has China not been the number one country. <laughs> and from the way the population uh, rates are, I think we can look at the next maybe even 500 years uh, that the, the population of this part will probably be the largest in the world. So this is a historic change for the planet. It is uh, also uh, probably the first time uh, that in the top powers of the world, uh, when you're talking about it, this kind of a size, you know, because you were the champion of democracy when the USSR 
was an autocratic a communist nation. Uh, China is a similar model. So this is the first time probably that at that, that stature, uh, another democracy uh, comes in. We call it the democratic dividend. What would be your uh, you know, opinion, advice, and if you were India, how would you conduct yourself from here on going <laughs> forward for the next 20 years? Oh Shall my gosh. I have spent my whole life not telling other countries how to run their country uh, and been pretty successful at avoiding that. It, but but it is, it, you're, you're absolutely correct about this. All right, think about this. The, the next big country will be Nigeria in terms of population. The demographics are pretty clear about the, dir the direction of growth for 20, 30, 40 years. I'm, I'm not sure I'll predict out to 500. Um, my, my, my thoughts always come, come back to this. Uh, the, the greatest driver for happiness for peoples are economic well-being and health. And so that often turns on GDP per capita, right? That often turns on how, how many resources are available for individuals. And then there's a component of this that is how broadly they are shared too. So there's an there's a, uh, there's a, uh, equity component to this as well. Do you, do, do you have a system that allows for mobility? for people to rise from poverty, uh, to create wealth, and to take care of their families. Uh, I, would, I, I, would urge, I, I wouldn't limit this to India. I, I, I urge leaders all across the world, be, be focused on the well-being of your own people and their economic success. Uh, it is easy to become subject to very powerful influence inside of your own country. The 10, the 50, the 100, the 1,000 people who exert enormous economic influence as leaders you have a responsibility to make sure that you are delivering on behalf of a sovereign, on behalf of a nation. How do you create the chance for, for someone like me, who grew up in very modest means, to get this crazy chance to be the Secretary of State of the United States of America? I, literally, if you would have met me, and maybe some of you did, when I was doing business here in Bangalore, and I had told you I was going to be the CI Director and the Secretary of State, you would have put me in an insane asylum. Right? You would have said, that's crazy. Uh, build a nation where people get those kinds of chances, where um, hospitals are good and the streets have sanitation. Right? These, these fundamentals. I, in, in America, we get caught up on things that happen in Washington. All the news that you see on CNN or on the BBC, the, the headlines are almost always from Washington. Folks, most of America doesn't give a rip about going on there. Most of America is doing what we do in Wichita, Kansas, trying to take care of their family, coaching their little league team or their kids' soccer team. Right? Th these are the things that build great nations. These are the things that, that, that will let the 1.4 billion people here in India view themselves, as you rightfully should, as a successful peoples, as a successful nation, uh, and one with glorious opportunity that sits in front of you. A focus on the things that, that matter, the things that are local, the things that you can have an impact on. Um, when we do those things, our leaders, your prime minister, our president, they will see that and then they can help build. They can help build out these geostrategic solutions that put your country in the right place and can continue to build India, India as a powerful force for good in the world. And I can see that today. It's not something that's 10 years off or 20 years off. I can see that today. Um, whenever I would come visit here when I was in government, I always I, I felt a peace when I was here. Right? A, a, a people who sought a, a amicable, peaceful way of moving forward but were deadly serious about growing their own business or their own economy. Um, th these are the things that will provide the world with the stability that it demands in these incredibly challenging times. Thanks a lot, Secretary. It's been really, really a pleasure talking to you, and uh, we really thank you for the trouble that you've taken, taking so many flights. It's all good. <laughs> and almost missing one, as I'm told. Thank you it's very all much. Good. Thank you all. Thank you.